Good day, folks. Aaron Sale here with another Quick Hits Ortho case. And today we're going to chat about a relatively rare diagnosis that's commonly missed, that's limb-threatening, uh, with lots of pitfalls in, in our understanding of it as eMERGE physicians, and that's acute compartment syndrome. So in keeping again with the Quick Hits theme, uh, we'll give you a case. It's a 90-year-old lady who twists her, her leg. Uh, she has a tib-fib fracture that's closed. It's quite painful. And recalling that the lower leg is the most common place in acute compartment syndrome, it's reasonable that you think about that. So you think about the five Ps, you think about reaching for the striker needle, so you have a number that you can tell the orthopedic surgeon before you call them for this case. So a few pitfalls in, in acute compartment syndrome that we should chat about. Some brief pathophysiology. So compartment syndrome is a, acute compartment syndrome is an acute rise in the pressure of an anatomic compartment. What does the increased pressure do? It leads to decreased capillary perfusion, which causes ischemia, which causes increased swelling, increased pressure, decreased perfusion, muscle necrosis, nerve necrosis, etc. So acute compartment syndrome concern would be limb threatening, and if infection sets in, life threatening. So let's talk about some of the epidemiology. Seventy percent of cases of acute compartment syndrome are related to an acute fracture. Thirty uh, percent are not there for. So what does that mean? That includes the crush injuries. It could be soft tissue infections. It could be extravasation of IV fluids. Uh, a dressing or a cast that's put on too tightly, so you can get an external compartment syndrome, can certainly be a, a cause of it. High pressure injection injuries are very high risk of it. So just keep that in mind. Let's talk about age group. So older adults, less likely to get compartment syndrome than younger adults. And that's because as we age, our muscle mass decreases. Therefore, there's more volume or more space available in a compartment. Some people also have this myth uh, or have this belief in eMERGE that if, if a fracture is open, it's basically releasing the fascia. And that's a real myth as well, because if you've ever seen a patient who has a, a fasciotomy done for compartment syndrome, they open that compartment from, from like the very proximal end of it to the distal end. And certainly, you know, most open fractures do not release of a compartment in the same way that a, a compartment fasciotomy would. So so don't dismiss the possibility of, of compartment syndrome because it's an open fracture. Let's chat about these five Ps that we, we all have to learn for our exams. So pain, paresthesias, paralysis, pulselessness, pallor. There are variations of the five Ps. Some say six Ps, some say seven Ps. But Really, the P that you have to worry about is pain out of proportion. That's most important. Uh, and then they may start to get some progressive paresthesias. But if you if you if you talk yourself out of it because you feel a pulse or because the patient can move their toes, that's a real red flag. It's a real problem if we do that because that's a very late sign. Pulselessness, paralysis are extremely late signs in compartment syndrome. And essentially, uh, if there's if they've already set in, it's probably too late to save the limb. So don't think that a neurovascular assessment is the same thing as compartment syndrome assessment. If you're feeling for compartments, you just you put your hands on their on their compartments and you feel you passively move their limb, and you see that if you cause some stretch of it of the muscles that are involved, passive stretching of it will increase the pain in compartment syndrome. But it's pain out of proportion. And that's a real highlight, and and don't talk yourself out of it because of the other piece. The other thing I'd tell you, I'd warn you about, is reaching for the striker needle. So. A, using one of these striker needles, it's, it's fairly complicated. If you haven't done it a lot, it's hard. Uh, there are like eight different steps. You've got to zero it properly. You have to make sure you're doing it properly because there's a lot of uh, inter-observer variability in the number that you get. Number two, where do you put the needle? So you better be, you know, if you're going to use it in the lower leg, you should be aware that there are four compartments in the lower leg, and you need to know that your needle is in the right place, number one. And then number two, the pressure readings are actually variable at different levels in the compartment. So you, you may need multiple pokes in the compartment. So that's another concern. Do you have it in the right place? And then number three, what does the number actually mean? It's, it's a rather random number what we decide uh, is compartment syndrome. So they talk about it being a, an absolute pressure of 30. Well, that's the classic definition. More and more you're hearing about this delta P, the difference between the diastolic pressure and the compartment pressure. And if that's less than 30, that's indicative of a compartment pressure. But a uh, orthopedic surgeons were doing a, they did a study, patients who had tib-fib fractures, they checked the pressures in their leg. And none of these patients had symptoms of or developed a compartment syndrome. And if you used an absolute pressure of 30, then 62% of these patients would have been diagnosed with compartment syndrome based on the number they got from the striker needle. And if you use delta P as the number, then 25% of the patients would have been diagnosed with compartment syndrome. But none of them actually had it. 
So patients had uh, numbers up in the 60s, uh, pressures in the 60s even, and they never developed it. So what does the number even mean? That's a problem. That's why most surgeons, if you tell them someone has compartment syndrome, they don't ask what the pressure is. They just they, they come in to assess the patient because it's an orthopedic emergency, and most orthopedic surgeons won't actually reach for the needle. Uh, the time the needle is super valuable is, of course, if a patient is comatose. So as a little pearl going forward, as you assess MSK patients in the emergency department, Instead of writing neurovascular intact, add a C in front of it. So make it compartments neurovascular intact, and you're feeling normal all the time. There is great value in feeling normal. And then when something is abnormal, your hands will actually tell you sometimes before you have a chance to process it. The same way that you feel a kid's neck and you go, that feels abnormal. The same way you put your hand on someone's belly and you say, hey, they've got like peritoneal signs. These things you'll start to recognize as you start to feel compartments. And then you'll make diagnoses more accurately. You won't dismiss them because they can move their toes or because their pulses are intact because we know now those are very late signs. And the five Ps are useful for oral exams, but they're really not useful at the bedside in that way. If you think someone has compartment syndrome, you know, give them something for pain and and serial assessments, go back and see them 15, 20 minutes, half an hour later, and see how they're feeling. That's a valuable test to do. Uh, if you feel compelled that you really want to reach for a device, then I'd suggest the best device to reach for. Uh, if you think someone has compartment syndrome, is actually the telephone to call the orthopedic surgeon, and, and not a striker needle because it's fraught with all kinds of dangers if we don't use them properly. So I hope these pearls and pitfalls have been helpful for you in, in thinking about acute compartment syndrome. Thanks again to Anton for the opportunity, and I look forward to the next installment, folks. All the best.